tablecloths and handkerchiefs. Oh, okay. Ask all the ministers to come forth and the loved ones that we can lay our hands on these cloths. Ask God to help. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, Hallelujah. this church with one accord are coming to thee asking for these handkerchiefs to be anointed with the Holy Spirit that when they go forward to be laid upon the sick and the afflicted, may each one be healed as we pray with one accord, asking for God's divine mercy for the sick and the afflicted according to the scriptures and the riches of Jesus Christ in his grace. We ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. Praise the Lord. This has been a mighty short two weeks to me, knowing that tomorrow it ends this meeting. I was just telling Brother Shores how I appreciate his fine cooperation, and Brother, all the brothers and all the sisters and all that's come in, the Four Square Church of God, Jesus Name, Church, uh, Faith Tabernacle. And all of them, assemblies, and everyone, we sure appreciate your cooperation. And now, tomorrow, the visitors here, and I want you to find these churches where you, your own church of your own denomination, and go there, church of your choice, wherever you wish to go. There'll be services at all of them tomorrow. And now, we don't. We're, we're just here coming kind of come in like this and to visit. And, of course, we, if you have no church, we'd be glad to have you tomorrow night. But if your church is having service tomorrow night, that's your duty. It's your post of duty at your church. We never want anyone to shirk their own church. We never want anybody to take money if they would put in their own church to sponsor one of these meetings. No, sir. That, your tithe and offerings goes into your own church. If you feel to help in one of these meetings or something, after your own church is taken care of, that's fine. But we never want to take one cent from any church. We are trying to help that church. We are trying to do all we can that you'll be a better member of that church. No matter what church it is, we want you to be a real loyal member and serve the Lord Jesus with all your heart. Now, and then tomorrow night is the closing service. and. Did you like last night's healing service? Was that, you like that kind of? Well, how would you like to have another one tomorrow night? Would that be fine? All right. Then I'll have them to give out prayer cards again tomorrow night, about six o'clock, as usual, or whatever time they, what is it, about six o'clock? Six, six o'clock. All right, six o'clock. And um, so they'll be here to give out the prayer cards tomorrow night. And we'll pray for the sick again tomorrow night in a, in a prayer line. Anybody can have them. They're without, without cost. They don't cost you a penny. You just come, they're free. That's the reason I have my own son giving them out. That there'll be no, no charges on them. No respect. We just give them out. Anybody wants them, just take them. Sometimes when we're having... Uh, then I ask him also that when we're having lines where we have to just call up a few... I asked him to get up before the audience and mix all those cards together. And then just give them because no one, and, he, and to make it double sure, no one knows where the prayer line's going to start in that meeting. I don't even know myself. That's the truth. I stand here and where the Lord puts up on my heart to start from, there's where I start from. I used to have a little child to come up and count. And wherever it stopped, I'd start from there. <laughs> that didn't work so good. You know, Mommy had Junior stop just exactly where her husband was. So we're still dealing with human beings. It was cute, but it wasn't just right for the people. And so then we go down first the meeting, we give out all the prayer cards. That's when they had big meetings and there were maybe hundreds of them give out. Well then I no need of anybody coming after that first night. If we was there two weeks, I'd never get through all them. About a six or eight a night, ten. They uh, never get through them, so that didn't work. People, if they wasn't there the first day, had not a chance to get in the prayer line. This way, everybody comes. Everybody's got the same equal. And we try now just to go through the line, pray for the whole group, and anybody wants to be prayed for. I think that's the best we can do. 
explaining faith, that it's your faith that heals you. Now, I want to read tonight, if you're keeping track of the scriptures, I want to read out of the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, which that's what it is, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the third chapter. The Lord bless his word, and we want to read of the condition of the church of this day, the Lady Ocean Church Age, beginning with the 14th verse. Unto the angel of the church of Lady Ocean, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, Spirit saith unto the churches. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of the Word. And now don't forget, pray. We used to sing a little song at our church. I don't know where you sang it here or not. Oh, I couldn't sing. I always wanted to. I, I thought I'd try, but my nerve won't let me do it. <laughs> I'll just say it. Pray, pray, the only way to reach higher ground, pray, pray, the prayer of faith will bring God's blessings down. That's right. How many likes good saints? Oh, that's fine. I just love it. I heard this brother in Michigan here this morning singing down there at the breakfast, and what a wonderful time we had. I just love singing and spiritual singing. I love good old Pentecostal singing, singing in the Spirit. I do dread to hear an overtrained voice <laughs> holding their breath till they turn blue in the face. And don't know what, they're just singing to get be heard. But I just like good old fashioned Pentecostal singing just where they clap their hands and have a good time. That's good singing. I always want to sing that. Song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I, I don't have a voice to sing. But someday when you all get over on the other side, and you're living in your big mansion up there somewhere, just glorifying God... Way down in the woods is a little cabin sets down there in a corner. And I, when you walk out on your front porch some morning, you look stand down on the cabin, you hear the voice come up through the woods singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Say the wretch like me. You say, Praise God, old brother Brandon made it. There he is. He can sing it now. <laughs> Finally made it. Got over on the other side. And if only way I'll ever get there is by the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. I love him, trust him, but it'll take his grace to get me over on the other side. 
Therefore, I'm not trusting in any ability. I have none. I'm trusting in what he did for me. He is my mediator. He's my propitiation for my sins. He's the water of separation. He's the Alpha, Omega. He's my life, my birth, my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my Lord, my King, my Savior, my healer. He's just all in all to me. I love my brethren, I love my sisters, but oh, that filial love would never take the place of that agapal love of the Holy Spirit. I love my wife, my children, just as much as any husband or father could, but it will never touch that sacred spot of that love of God, how rich and pure, how fabulous and strong, it shall forever more endure saints and angels' songs. Oh, I love that. I better stop now. In the 20th verse of this certain chapter of Revelation, here, third chapter in the 20th verse, I want to read a text, if I should call it that, speak for a little while, and then see what our Heavenly Father will have us to do. I don't know. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice, open the door, I will come into him and sup with him, and he with me. You say, Brother Branham, that's a very small text for a crowd this size. But you know, it isn't the size of the text, it's the contents it holds. There's enough in there to open the eyes of every sinner in the world. There's enough in there to save the entire world. You know what? Things today, we're looking at big things. But we leave off the little things. Here some time ago, I don't know whether I've ever told you about it or not, it was in a certain city. A little boy was up in the attic looking around and he, he found in an old trunk, a little postage stamp, just about one half inch square. Well, he knew where there was a stamp collector down the street, so he run down the street, thought maybe the stamp collector would give him five cents for the postage stamp to go in his album, and it would, he would get him a cone of ice cream. And he ran down the street real quick to the stamp collector, and he said, look at this stamp I have just found, and called him by his given name said, how much will you give me for it? And the stamp collector looked at it through his glass, his old and turned yellow. He said, oh, I, I'll give you a dollar for it. Oh, the bargain was made right quick and the business was on. That was about 20 cones of ice cream. Oh, he stole the stamp right quick. I may have the over or underestimation. But I believe that stamp was sold about two weeks later for around $500. And then later on it was sold for an enormous amount and has went on and on till I just don't know how much that stamp's worth. It's one of the most valuable stamps there is in the collector's album. What made it so valuable? It wasn't because of the size of it. It wasn't because of the paper that it was written on because it had already turned yellow. But it's what was on it that counted. That's the way it is with this text tonight or any scripture. It isn't the size of it or the paper it's written on. It's what it is written on it. It is the word of the living God which is just as eternal as the author of the writing. Great in every promise is true. It's unusual, too, because it draws a picture of someone knocking at the door. I'm just not able at this time to call the name of the artist that wrote that famous picture, or drawn it, rather, painted it. 
that he stood and painted the picture of Jesus coming and knocking at the door. I think he was a Greek artist. Wasn't Angelo, I don't think. But I'm not sure just what his name was, but all famous pictures, before they can become famous, they have to go through the Hall of Critics. I've often thought that about the church. Before God can ever take his church in the rapture, it has to go through the hall of critics, the world to criticize it, make fun of it, call it out of its name. But then, when it's finally passed through that hall of critics, then the picture of painting can be hung in the hall of fame. That's what God will do with his church. He'll let it go through the criticism and persecution of the world, but someday he'll take it up in the air and put it in the hall of fame. Seated at his right side. This great artist had taken him a lifetime to paint the picture. When finally he thought all of it was ready for the hall of critics and After a while, a certain critic came up, and they were educated to criticize. Great, famous critics. And he said, your picture is an outstanding picture. We can see the Jesus coming at night in the darkness of human life with his lantern in the hand. See the lovely little home that he comes to and the vines around the door and so forth. See him with the expression on his face, knocking, listening, trying to hear if there would be an answer from the inside. The critic said, there is nothing to criticize that. You have done a masterpiece. But there is just one thing that you have failed to do. And the artist said, Sir, what is that thing I have failed to do? He said, You failed to put a latch on the door. He said, There's no latch on it. Oh, said the artist, I painted it that way. Well, he said, how could he ever get in if there wasn't a latch? He said, the latch is on the inside. The man that's on the inside has to open. I stand and knock at the door, and if any man will open. God doesn't pull your heart open. He just knocks, and you have to open it up. I stand and knock, and if any man will hear my voice and open, I'll come in and sup with him, and he with me. Now supping in the Old Testament or in the oriental days of the Lord's visit to the earth was communing. I will come in and will have communion with him. Sit down and talk. Things over. Don't you want him to do that with you? Here in Phoenix a few years ago, there was a man and woman saying that. And I got it on a little rubber record. I'd like to talk it over with him. Got to preach at that church tomorrow where they come from. And I hope they're there. I'd like to hear it again. I'd like to say, Jesus, you love me when my path got so dim. Greatest time of my life is when I could sit down and my path got dim and I did not know which way to turn, east, west, north, or south, and just talk it over with him. And the first thing you know, I was on the other side of the thing, talk it over with him. When a man knocks at a door, he's trying to gain 
entrance. He's trying to get in. He wants to talk with you. That's why he's knocking. Now, it's not an unusual thing for someone to knock on someone's door. We've had it through the ages. Great man has knocked at doors. For instance, what if we would say tonight, what in the days of Caesar, the great emperor of Rome, if he went down to a peasant's house and knocked at the door, and the peasant rushed to the door, opened up the door, and there stood the great mighty emperor of Rome, knocking at his door. Well, that poor little fellow would almost have a heart attack. Think of the great and mighty Caesar stands at my door. What an honor it would be for the emperor of Rome to knock at a peasant's house why he would trembling fall on his knees and he'd say, Sir, if there is anything that's in my reach that I could do for you, great emperor, I'll do anything that you require me to do. And if it is possible, honor my humble little home by sticking your feet into the door. It will be an honor that my home sheltered the emperor of this great nation. And it would be an honor. Or in the Germany, the late dictator Adolf Hitler, in the days of his great Miss in Germany, if he had went to a German soldier's door and knocked at the door, and the little soldier would have run to the door, not knowing who it was, knocking and pulled the door open, and while well, he'd seen the great Adolf Hitler, the fear of Germany standing there, that little soldier would have come to attention, giving the German snoot with his lips trembling and tears running down his cheeks. He just said, Great fear of Germany, you have honored my home. Come in. You make me feel so good to know that you would come to my door. It's an honor that every man cannot have. For you, the great Hitler, to knock at my door and to come here to honor me with your presence. Our, if President Dwight Eisenhower, our most beloved president, if he would come here to Phoenix tomorrow and would come to the house of the best Democrat there is in Phoenix, it would be an honor to you Though you would differ with him in politics. Yet he's a great man. He's the president of our United States. He's an honorable man. One of the highest honorable men there is in this nation. Is our beloved president. Mr. Eisenhower. Just recently the Queen of England made a trip over here. What if she would have come to Phoenix and went down to your house and knocked at the door and you'd have opened the door and there stood the Queen of England at your door. Though she has no rule over you, you're not in her domain, but yet you'd have been honored to have the greatest queen on the earth standing at your door to pay you a visit. You would have said, Queen... Come into my house. And if there is anything here that you are seeking, oh, it would be a privilege for me to give it to you. Sure, she's a great woman. 
One of the greatest queens on earth today is the Queen of England. If she'd have asked you for some little something that you cherish with all your heart, you'd have still give it to her. It'd have been an honor for you to do it. No matter what you value that, you gave it to the greatest queen in the earth. See, it depends on the importance of the person at your door. I want to ask you something. Who's more important to knock at your door than Jesus Christ? Where is there a greater person that can knock at your door than Him? And He's knocked at more doors than all the kings there ever was in the world or ever will be. And He's turned away more than any ever was ever turned away. I stand at the door and knock. The God of glory. Now, perhaps if Mr. Eisenhower would knock at your door, he probably would want you to vote for him. Or he might have something else to take from you, some favor for you to do for him. The queen might understand that you have a certain relic that you value, and, and she like that. Wants to take something from you. But it isn't so with Jesus. When He knocks, He wants to give you something. Amen. The best thing that could be given, that's eternal life. Amen. That's the reason of His knocking. Why would anyone turn Him away? I'll stand and knock, and if any man will open, I'll come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. He wants to heal you, wants to forgive your sins. He wants to do something good for you. And yet, people turn him away more than they would President Eisenhower. Now I want to say something. Like this. If President Eisenhower would humble himself or the Queen of England and would come to your house and knock at your door, you'd brag about it to everybody. You'd want everybody to know that the President come to your house. And yet Jesus can knock at the door and we're ashamed to tell anybody about it. Ashamed of the Lord Jesus when He knocks and trying to give you something. Take the nation's attitude. Take Phoenix's attitude. If President Eisenhower or Mr. Nixon, our lovely Vice President, would come to Phoenix and go visit your house and knock at your door, it would be on international news. And he would get praises for humbling himself. All the poor people in your neighborhood and around the country would appreciate knowing that that great man humbled himself to come to your door or my door. And yet Jesus knocks night after night, even to bootleggers, prostitutes, harlots. And he's cast away as some fanatic. What's the judgment going to be? Oh, you might say to me, just a minute, preacher. I've already accepted Jesus into my heart. Maybe that's just what you've done. Accepted him into your heart. But did you know when he gets into your heart, how welcome is he after he gets in? If I come to your house and you, I knocked at your door and you give me the right hand of fellowship and told me to come in, and then said, you stand right there. Don't you go to meddling around in my house. 
Well, that's about the way some people accept Jesus. You know, there's more than one door to the heart. These doors, little compartments in the heart. That's where you live at, in these little compartments. And then when, what if we look over some of them compartments and see what they are? Now think of it. What if you come to my house and you knock at the door and I come over there and I say, come in. And you come in. I said, now looky here, I don't want you meddling around in my house. You stand right there and tell me what you want. But don't go to fooling around in my house. You wouldn't feel very welcome. I wouldn't feel welcome at your house. If you welcome me in, I expect you to say, Come in, Brother Branham. So glad to have you. The house is yours. Take over. Do what you want to. Oh, I'd just do that. Come in, take off my shoes and lay across the bed. Go out to the refrigerator and get me a great big sandwich and lay there and eat. I'd feel at home. That's the way Jesus wants to do in your heart. He wants to feel at home. But we got him closed off to a lot of things. Now, Jesus, I'll tell you why I'll let you in my door. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be saved at the end of the life. You can come in the door, but now don't you go to meddling around. When you get in the human heart, let's think this, that over on the right-hand side, there's a little closet, a little door. That's a hard one that most people don't want anyone meddling with, and that's called over that door, the door of my private life. Now, Jesus, I'll let you in. But don't you go to meddling with my private life. If I have to stop my card party, if I have to give up the, the pool room bunch that I run with, if I have to be called old-fashioned because I don't smoke cigarettes with the rest of the women, if I have to burn up my shorts and can't wear them like the rest of the women, you stay right there. Don't meddle with me. That's the way lots of Christians accept Jesus. Amen. He wouldn't be welcome in your heart. Don't you interrupt any of my... I drink a little sociable beer. And I don't want you to bother with that. Only I, I'll let you in because I don't want to go to hell. Now, is that the way you accepted Jesus? Jesus don't want to come in like that. When he's knocking at your heart, when he comes in, he wants to be your Lord. Lord is rulership. He comes into your heart knowing that he made that heart for himself. All the rest of the body you can have. But the heart is the control tower. And he wants to come to this heart so he can lead you. Be Lord. You want Him as your Savior, but not your Lord. So many people say, oh, I want Him as my Savior. I've accepted Him as my Savior. That's good. But have you accepted Him as your Lord to be ruler over you, to rule you, to guide you, to walk into that door of your private life and clean the closet out, take His own blood and paint it on the walls. Then right next to that is a, another little door called pride. Oh, that's a terrible one. Everybody wants a little pride. If you can't let Jesus in and take over pride, then Jesus won't stay. He'll get right out. If you think that you're better than the Joneses, you drive a better car or eat a better meal, Wear better clothes than the Joneses and you're stuck up? Then Jesus will leave that heart at the same door he come in at. Oh, this day of fantastic fancy put on. I'm glad for people who have in a way that's a surrendered heart that Jesus can come in and be Lord and God and Savior and Controller. 
When you get Jesus into your heart, all that pride will go out. I'll tell you what it'll do for you, a good old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Spirit will make a pair of overhauls and a tuxedo suit put their arms around one another and call each other brother. It'll make a calico dress and a silk one hug one another and say, Sister! That's what Jesus does when He's Lord. But He's just Savior. Well, that's not enough. If He's a Savior, He must be Lord also to guide you to His salvation. If He's the Savior. There's another little door just around the corner. It's the door of faith. Oh, there's many of them. Let's talk of faith just a moment. Now, I'll let you in, Jesus, but I've got my own faith. Well, He can't do much for you. If you've got your own faith, I don't want no faith. I want His faith. My faith is no good. The faith of God is what we need. God's faith in us. My faith is no good. Your faith is no good. It takes Christ to come in and stand in that door of faith and be Lord. Lord over your faith. When you read in the Bible, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday day and forever, your faith will say, that's impossible. But His faith will say, Amen, I am. If the critic says the days of miracles is past, the faith of God will say he doesn't know what he's talking about. If the critic says Jesus doesn't heal, the Holy Spirit standing in the door of your faith will say, I'm the Lord that healeth all of thy diseases. It just makes such a difference. To let him at that door of faith. You know the scripture we was reading a while ago said that you are naked and you are miserable. You are poor, wretched, and blind and don't know it. That's the condition that the church will come to. Naked. Would you imagine a man on the street naked and doesn't know it? If the man knows it, he'll help himself. Or the woman on the street. Or someone who doesn't have on clothing. And if they know that they're that way, they'll try to help themselves. But the pitiful case, they're so mentally gone, they don't know it. Today, people walking on the streets of these cities are naked before God. And don't know it. That's the pitiful part. Glory to God. They're trying to cover up with some church creed. Like Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Man-made fig leaves. God requires a shed blood covered counsel of me. That you get white raiment to cover your nakedness. And he said also, Thou art blind, spiritually speaking, blind, and I'll counsel of thee to buy some eye salve from me. You know, God's got healing for everything. Sin, sick souls, bodies, backsliders, whatever you are, God's got the remedy in his big medicine cabinet. You know, when I was a little boy, we lived down in, way down in east, southeast Kentucky in the Cumberland Mountains. And my people, we lived in a little old log cabin, had two rooms. And it was a pitiful looking thing. They didn't have any floor in it but the dirt. And Dad had cut off the top of a stump about that thick, put three legs under for a table. And had got an old piece off of the barn and made a, a little bench that these little Branhams could sit on there and eat their dinner. And for 
There was one bed, and that was Papa's and Mama's, set over at the left of the house when you come in from the kitchen. And us kids had to go up a ladder, a homemade ladder, two saplings with some sticks across it. We went up in the loft, and there was an old straw mattress. I don't know whether you ever seen one or not. An old feather bed. And they had clapboard shingles on it, and, and this, this put on in the light of the moon, and they had turned up. And the old chinking out of the logs, Mama would have to put a piece of canvas over us kiddies at night for the snow blowing in would give us colds. And sometimes, like little boys, there was nine of us. How we'd wiggle out from under the cover. And they would, of a morning, our eyes would be all closed from cold. Mama said it was matter in them. I don't know what it is, but she called it matter. They'd stick together. Get cold in your eyes. Grandpa was a hunter. Trapped and hunted all his life. Grandmother was an Indian. Cherokee Indian. And we had a cure-all at our house. That was coon grease. Raccoons. Grandpa would catch them. Then he'd render the fat out. Put it in a can. And it was good for a croup or a sore throat or, or a bruised toe, anything. It was almost a cure-all at our house. So when Mama would come to the steps and I was the oldest, and she'd say, William, come on down. I'd turn over to my brother Edward, which is gone on now. I called him Humpy. And I said, wake up, Humpy. Mama's calling. and said, I can't get my eyes open. I said, I can't either, and all the little boys couldn't get their eyes open nearly because there'd been a draft across there. We'd gotten from under the cover, the protection, and it'd give us a cold and we had matter in our eyes. Mama said, that's all right, honey, I'll be up just in a few minutes, and she'd get the coon grease and set it on the, the stove and get it all hot. And we eat the raccoons herself. So then she'd get this coon grease hot, and come up and massage your eyes with it till all the matter went out. Believe it or not, she fixed us up with it. We got all right. That might help open up the eyes, you're natural. But we've had a cold spell too. Many Christians has got from under the cover, under the protection of the Lord Jesus. There's been a draft across the country saying that the days of miracles is past and healing services and all this Holy Ghost stuff, there's nothing to it. You might have got caught in the draft, got your eyes all closed up to the things of God. When the angel of God comes here in the last days to reflect the light of the coming of Jesus, you might not be able to see it. I wouldn't prescribe coon grease, but... I know there is some eye sad that God has. It's called the Holy Spirit. God's anointed oil from God's throne. That'll open your eyes and you'll be able to see that Jesus Christ is just the same today as He was yesterday and will be forever. God's Holy Spirit today moving in from great healing services Coming down to the positive, Jesus coming among the people and performing and doing the same signs of the nearing of the end of this age, like he did to the Jews when he told Philip he was under the tree, or Nathaniel was under the tree when Philip found him, and he said, Rabbi, how did you know me when he told him he was a honest man, an Israelite, no guy? When Jesus told him where he was, he fell at his feet and said, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel because he had opened his heart to the Spirit of God knocking that had been prophesied by Moses, their leader, 
saying, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like it unto me, and it shall come to pass that ever who not hear this prophet shall be cut off. And practically the whole nation was cut off. God not. The church looked and said, You know that man's a fortune teller, Beelzebub. Jesus said, You say that about me, I'll forgive you. But someday the Holy Spirit will come and to speak one word against it will never be forgiven. Don't you see the church is cutting yourself off again? But not opening their heart and letting the Holy Spirit come in. Did not he say to the woman at the well, Go get your husband? Samara had never seen him. But they were looking for him. And she said, I have no husband. He said, well, you've had five and the one that you're living with is not yours. Her heart come open. She said, sir, you must be a prophet. We know the Messiah is coming. Oh, my. That woman know more about God than a lot of preachers does. That's right, though, in her ill fame. She had a heart that could open when God knocked at the door. She knew the Holy Scriptures that the day was at hand. She said, I know that Messiah cometh. We know that. And when He comes, He'll do this. He said, I'm He that speaks to you. Right into her heart He went. Down through the city and said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? Did not this same Messiah said? Just before he returns, that's the sign that was given to Sodom. And Gomorrah would return again in the age of the Gentiles. Christ knocks at the heart, saying yesterday, today, and forever. His word speaks it. His spirit confirms it among the people. Why not open up our heart and let him come in and be Lord? He's so good to us. And yet... We are so cruel to Him. We appreciate our churches, our pastors, our lay members, our deacons, our all societies. We appreciate them. And they're doing a wonderful work, most of them. Thanks be to the Lord. But yet, it takes the individual. The church can't open up your heart. You have to open your heart. The church cannot come into your heart. Jesus must come into your heart. Church cannot be Lord over you. Christ is Lord over you. Yet you belong to the church. That's his society. That's his way of doing it. But yet you must let him in and then join with other believers. That's what does it. Now, we're living in the last days. We look around and see the goodness of God. How that in our days when there's not a hope. Looky here, did you realize... That we're at the end time? Do you realize all the great man in the world is predicting that something, well, we could be blown up at any minute? And the Holy Spirit has given you the privilege of coming in the midst of where he's at and knocking at your heart's door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You say, Brother Branham, I can't understand it. Just open up once. Let him come in. I don't know just how to believe these signs and all these things. I don't know. That's what the Ethiopian said to Philip. How can I know this lest some man teaches me? The Holy Spirit was sent here for a teacher. Let him come into your heart. He'll teach you that Jesus is the same. He said, when the Holy Ghost has come, he will testify of me. And we know that that's true. Now... He's so good, it looked like that we could appreciate his goodness. When the world's starving to death, we have plenty. How many little children in India tonight, in many places, nothing to eat, would give anything? How many hungry-hearted people seeking God would give anything to sit in this meeting tonight? Let me give you a sight that's sickly. How many people have sunk beyond the regions of mercy? into a devil's hell in a torment of a nightmare, how they'd love to come back yes, amen. and have one more chance. Yes, what would they do tonight 
Give Jesus to come to hell and knock at their heart. Amen. You turn me away in this day, in the days of your calamity, when you call, I'll only laugh. This is the day. Don't put it off tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Yet many of you maybe has waited for years. He's knocked and knocked and knocked. You don't answer? He's a good God, as Oral Roberts has often stated. He is a good God. He's a God of mercy, and he's also a God of judgment. Amen. Now, down in the south where I go a whole lot, I was on a little vacation the other day down there. A bunch of people, of some good old crackers down there in Florida. We were out fishing. And that's some Brother Evans is bitten by that rattlesnake, and I've never seen it before in my life. Two miles back, I had to pack a 180-pound man. A big old ground rattler, worse than your sidewinder any time. Struck him in the foot, his whole leg just paralyzed. Tried to help me in with about a 12-pound bass. In the weeds were gators and everything laying around. And he jumped to grab it. And he just screamed and held his leg. I come out and there's two fang holes about like that blood oozing out of them. He said, Brother Brennan, my whole side is froze. It's aching so hard. How could I pack him through the swamps? Weighed about 180 pounds, six foot tall. His brother had been bitten a few months before there, sinner, went to the hospital in a terrible condition. And I said, Oh, Brother Evans, merciful God, I thought, what can I do? I remembered the scripture. What was it? Someone knocking at the door. I'm the Lord thy God. I'm a very present help in a time of trouble. I remember he said, they shall tread on the heads of serpents and scorpions, and nothing in no means shall harm them. I laid my hand over on his foot, him screaming with his tears, dripping off of his cheeks like that from pain. I said, Heavenly Father, I'm knocking at your door. We're in a state of emergency. Have mercy, O oh God. And while we said that and I quoted the scripture, I looked over and he was laughing. All pains is gone. We fished the rest of the day, and that night at 12 o'clock, when we were down there getting the pictures, I guess it's somewhere around there, Gene, getting the tourists all come in to see this great string of bass that the Lord had given us. And his brother come up, and we told the story. And his sinner brother said, Wait a minute, Welch. said, It's all right to be religious, but not crazy. He said, You know I lay three months in the hospital. And two months after that, with a cast on my leg, with that one of them rattler bites, said, you get the medical aid just as quick as you can. He said, look here, brother, you might know a lot of things, but you don't know all things. God. If my God could deliver me from 11 o'clock this morning till 11 o'clock night, he can take care of me the rest of the time. What was it? Knocking on his door in a time of emergency. We shouldn't wait till that time of an emergency. Someday death's going to come up to your door and it's going to knock. Oh my, you're going to long for that knock then. I've seen people who laughed at the Holy Spirit. I've held them when they died. Don't laugh at Christ. Respect Him. Honor Him. Get away from all your own theologies and senses. Just let the Holy Spirit... You was given five senses, but them five senses, your intellectuals, was never given to you to lead you. The sixth sense, which is faith was given to you to lead you. That's the sixth sense. That is the super sense. It leads you. Down in Shreveport, Louisiana, with a good old friend of mine, Brother Moore, there was an old colored brother down there who, he was a nice old man. His name was Gabriel. They give him his mother, religious woman, his daddy, they give him the name of Gabriel. But we all called him Gabe just for short. And his wife was a staunch Christian, very lovely person. And the pastor of the church was a wonderful brother. And they'd done everything they could to get old Gabe to get straightened out with God. But Gabe liked to shoot dice and, and he, he just wouldn't get straight with God. And Gabe liked to hunt, and so did the pastor. 
And the pastor come over and get Gabe and take him a hunting and, and so forth. And one day when they'd been hunting, old Gabe was so loaded with game, birds and rabbits, till he could hardly get any mad at him over his gun barrel coming in, all that he could wag in. And they were coming around a little certain path. And old Gabe kept noticing back towards the west and the sun was going down. He's getting up into the years, his fifties. And he kept watching that sun. The pastor faithfully making his way along the path. Both of them with so much game. After a while, the pastor felt a hand on his shoulder touching him. He said, Pastor, and he turned around. Gabe was looking at him, the tears running down his cheeks. He turned again and looked towards the sun. He turned back and said, Pastor, in the morning, being Sunday morning, I was coming down to the church with my loving wife. I was going to go up to the mourner's bench and make my confession. Now I'm going to find me a seat just as close to the front as I can find. There I remain until Jesus comes to get me. I'll live true to God from this day on. The pastor turned and put his arms around his brother. Said, Gabe, bless your heart, boy. Said, you see that son sitting on her pastor? My son's going down too. And something knocked at my heart just a few moments ago. He said, what sermon did I preach, Gabe? What message did I preach that you heard that caused you to turn? Or what hymn did the singers sing that caused you to turn? And give your life to the Lord Jesus. He said, Pastor, I've heard you preach a mighty good sermon many times. I've heard the choir sing till it looked like they had the anthems of the angels. He said, it was all so good. He said, but that's not what done it, Pastor, altogether. He said, I was coming along here thinking how good he is to me. Just how good. He said, you know, Pastor, I'm a poor shot. He said, I couldn't hit nothing. And we was needing food at our house. And just look at all this game that he's given me. Surely he must love me or he wouldn't do it for me. He said, I turned around to say thank you. And something knocked in my heart and said, the son of your life is going down. He's good to us. Gabe done just what he told the pastor he would do, and as far as I know, he's still a charter member of that Pentecostal body of believers down there. Because he looked out and seen the goodness of God, and something knocked at his heart and said, Gabe, I give you them things. You couldn't hit nothing. I give them to you. I want you to ask tonight, who gave you your automobile? Who give you that good meal you eat tonight? Who give you these nice clothes you're wearing? How can you turn him down when the sun of civilization is setting? The sun of time is setting. Jesus is coming and he's knocking night after night at heart's doors. Won't you open tonight, my poor dejected friend, and let him come in to you and sup with you and you with him? Won't you think about that now while we bow our heads this morning? I ask that you'll be very reverent now. The Holy Spirit might find its place in the heart. How good is he to you? Look, laying here in the hospital. Look at that close call a while ago in that car. Think of the time when you said to that little one or that mother, I'll meet you across the sea, honor mama, daddy, husband, wife, brother, child. And yet he's blessed you and you're able to be here tonight. That comes from God. 
While you have your heads bowed, I wonder if someone here tonight in this visible audience would like to say to Jesus, Lord, you've been so good to me. I want you to come into my heart right tonight. Don't let daybreak in the morning without you coming to my heart. I want to talk it over with you. I know we're at the end time. Our science says we are. Our nation knows we are. The Navy knows we are. The Army knows we are. And above all that, the Bible says we are. And the Holy Ghost with his signs to the church confirm that we are. You've been so good to me, Lord. I'd like to talk it over with you before I cross over. Would you like to raise your hand to him for a little communion before we close in prayer? Just raise up your hand and say, God, be merciful to me. I want to talk it over with you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you, lady. The Lord bless you. Up in the balconies to the right. The Lord bless you there, sir. Someone else, I'd like to talk it over. You're knocking, Lord, I want to. I want to talk with you just a little bit. The next few minutes, Brother Brandon, include me in your prayer. God will hear your prayer. Balcony to the left. Someone raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. The balcony in front. God bless you, lady. God bless you. Beneath there on the floor. God bless you. Two more right there. Good. Oh, I see your hands all back in there. All back to the right. God bless you. God bless every one of you. The center rolls through here. Raise up your hand. Say, be merciful to me, Lord. I, I want to talk it over before I leave here. I, you're knocking at my heart. I, I feel like I ought to talk it over with you. I've got some things I'd like to settle. Raise your hands in the middle aisle. The aisles to the left, would you raise your hands? God bless you, sister. God bless you, you and you and you. God bless you. That's good. God be merciful. Thou art God of all generations. And you said that in this day of the Lady of Sin Church, that you would stand at the door and knock. And if any man would hear the knock and would open the door, you'd come in and sup with them. And now there's been a great host here, and maybe 30 or more tonight has raised their hands. Knowing that you are here knocking at their door. Now, Lord, you promised you would come in. I believe you. They believe you. So speak peace to their hearts, Lord. And I offer this prayer in their behalf. That there will not be one of them lost. May they all be saved by your amazing grace. May Jesus enter into their hearts tonight, take the reins and all the doors be open, that he might be both Savior and Lord, that he could guide them through life's smoky pitfalls and lead them unto the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. And from there unto the great home of the living God, where the soul never dies, where there's no sickness, sorrow, or old age, no death there cannot enter that blessful holy place. Lord, let their soul take its eternal rest. From this hour on upon that great promise, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and he that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. I'll raise him up at the last days, give him eternal life. And again it is written, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense eternal life, shall not come to the judgment, but pass. From death unto life. Grant it, Lord, I commit them into thy hands now. Bless those who are sick and afflicted. May these who raise their hands tomorrow morning, like old Gabe down in Louisiana, found his way to the church. They're baptized into the Christian faith. 
confessed Jesus as his Savior, took his place at the front, and there remained. May they do likewise, Lord. If I not get to shake their hands in this life, may in that life that is to come, may I fellowship with them through all ages, throughout eternity. Bless those who are needy here tonight, Father. If there be some left from last evening that didn't get healed, we pray that you'll heal them tonight. Speak mercy for, merciful to them that they might know that it's your Spirit knocking at their door. May they invite you in tonight, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's and sinners plunged Don't you love him? Isn't he wonderful? So good. So full of mercy and goodness. How great thou art. How good he is. Let us all just in the spirit of worship now sing this, this verse. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Let us sing it now, all right, Brother Creature. All right. The dying thief rejoice to see that fountain Don't you love that good old-fashioned sweetness of the Holy Spirit? Oh, my. Oh, I just love that. The same peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Do you know it?
coming down from the Father of love. So he opened my spirit for I pray in fathomless beauty. our loyalty with our hands up. Because you first loved us and so loved us when we were sinners, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him would have eternal life. This that we know we pass from death unto life, when we have fellowship one with another and love one another, and the blood of Jesus thy Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Father, let the Holy Spirit wave after wave sweep over our souls. And cleanse us from the things of the world. Come into our hearts tonight, Lord. And not only to be Savior, but be Lord. Take our intellectuals and cast them from us, Lord, if they are contrary to your word. Let us see only Jesus and him crucified. Let us walk not according to our guidance of our mind, but by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Granted, Father, sanctify this group of people tonight who's been setting present. May they never forget the doors inside of their hearts. Now may the Holy Spirit come and reveal himself to us. God, if we found grace in your sight, let him come now and prove that you are here with us in this last day. You are the door to the sheepfold. You are the coming king. You are the Lord of glory, the God of Abraham. The rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the morning star, the alpha omega, the beginning and the end, he that was and which is and shall come, the root and offspring of David, O oh God, you are counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting Father, you're the Savior, the healer, you're all, Lord. We love you and we cherish you and we throw all of our heart open, Lord, let the King of glory come in. Lift up ye everlasting gates and be ye lifted up and let the King of glory come in. Take in full possession as Savior, as Lord, as King, as Director, as Governor, as Giver of peace, as Director of our past. Grant it, Lord. We ask that in the name of Him that taught us all to pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
the goodness of the Lord is with us. Oh, I would rather be here in a meeting like this with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, setting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, a fellowship of joy divine. There's nothing like it under the heavens. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. The works that I do shall they do also. More than this, because I go to my Father. A little while in the world seeth me no more, yet ye shall see me. For I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is there any sick in the building? Raise your hands. It wants to be remembered in prayer. It's just everywhere. How many sick people in here that knows that I don't know you? Raise your hand. How many knows that God knows you? Raise your hand. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll honor the gospel that I preach. If he isn't God, if he's dead, he remains dead. He's in the grave like the Mohammedans say. Let us see him do the same thing that he did when he was here on earth and promised he would do. We believe he raised from the dead. But your teaching is no more than ours. And we can produce just as much psychology as you can. Oh, they don't realize that our loving Jesus lives. Every promise that he made is true. Everything that he did. He's the high priest of our confession. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. If you're sick, touch him. He'll act just the same way he did when he was here on earth. The woman touched his garment and went and sat down. Or wherever she went in the crowd, he turned and said, Who touched me? And Peter said, Well, they all touched him, rebuked him. Why would you say such a thing? He said, But I got weak. Virtue went from me. Somebody touched me. And he looked around until he found her, told her, Her blood issue had stopped. Her faith had saved her. And she was healed. If he's the same Jesus and you can touch him by faith, there's no garment here for you to touch. But there is a God that you can touch with your faith. With your finger of faith. The finger of God that's in you, let it touch. Then he'll work to his branches. He's the vine. He has no lips but ours, no eyes but ours to operate here on earth. His Holy Spirit is here to energize his branches to do the same work. If a fellow took a watermelon off of a vine, and the next man went back and got a pumpkin, it wasn't from the same vine. If it did, it was artificially drafted in. But if that vine ever puts forth another vine... You'll have a watermelon. So if the first vine that come out of the branch had a Pentecostal church that done the same signs that Jesus did, the next branch will do the same thing. We drafted trees, sure. Put grapefruit on an orange tree. I think it'll bear. Yes, but it ain't original fruit. That tree never put forth it. It was drafted. We got too many drafts in today. I want the same spirit was up on him. I preached to you about Abraham and the confirmation of the covenant. When he tore that covenant apart, it was dovetailed the same way. The same When God made his covenant with man at Calvary, he tore the part of his own son. He took his body up and lifted it up out of the grave and set it on his right hand, sent the spirit that was in that body back to the church. That church will have to have the same kind of a spirit in his body that that body had, or the covenant is not right. Oh, what assurance, blessed assurance. Pray now. If the Holy Spirit will come and at least take two or three people here tonight, we took up our prayer cards last night, and if he'll come tonight and do just like he did when he was sure on earth. How many knows that the way that he confirmed his ministry of being Messiah was knowing the secret of their heart? Amen. Okay. Sure. Believers that was ordained to eternal life believed it. 
There was many there who professed believers that was not ordained to eternal life. Isn't it a sad thing to see that people, human beings, will sit and look and yet can't see it? Jesus said, well, did Isaiah speak of you? Have eyes and can't see, ears and can't hear? Yet looking right at it? Oh, they just couldn't understand it because it wasn't ordained to eternal life. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. My sheep know my voice. Aren't you glad you're sheep tonight? Aren't you glad you can see his word made manifest? See the coming of the Lord Jesus? All right, you pray now. May the Holy Spirit help me. Uh, this will not heal you. But it'll let you know. Look at how, not over in some dark corner, right out here where you're looking like our Lord's book. Perfect strangers don't know them. No more than Jesus knew Peter when he come or the rest or whatever it was. He knew him. And right at last it was hid from him for a long time. Then they said finally, oh, now, now we believe. Now we know that God shows you all things. Because he said, I can do nothing until I see the Father doing it. He's the same yesterday today. Only it isn't his flesh. His blood sanctifies your flesh and my flesh that his spirit might come in and continue the work until the consummation. That's right. Pray. Believe. Just that you might know. I'm going to turn my back to the audience. Now remember, when I do this, don't let me get letters. Saying, Brother Bram, you called yourself that angel. That's wrong. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of Christ. No matter what I did, no matter how much God anointed me, if you wasn't anointed also, it wouldn't work. It's your faith that does it. This is just a gift. Just to pull a lever back far enough to let William Branham step off of the scene so Jesus Christ can work. Now, you pull your lever back far enough that you can get off the scene if Jesus Christ can work. And I'm telling you, when the spirit of life begins to battle with the spirit of death, something takes place. Darkness cannot stay in light. Neither can death stay where there is life. Something takes place. Based on what? Your faith. I'll turn my back. That you might know that the word of Jesus, when that angel come down there in Sodom, and went to the... Now remember, can you see it today? The intellectual group doesn't receive it. It isn't even sent to them. Where's it at? The called out group. The elected group. That's where it was. Abraham's group. Called out. Separated. There was believers locked in his group down there. There was unbelievers. And two ministers, angel ministers, went down there with the Spirit of God in them and preached to them. Called them out. Get out of it. But they wouldn't listen. Just a few come out. Same way it is now. But the angel has stayed back to talk to Abraham, the elect. Watch what kind of sign he gave. But Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? How do you know she had? He had a wife. How do you know her name was Sarah? Said she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you, Abraham. A man eating cash flesh, cornbread, drinking milk. Said, according to the time of life, and you're going to have that child that I promised you 25 years ago. And Sarah, being nearly 100, 90, and Abraham 100, she laughed within herself. <laughs> he said, why did Sarah laugh? Jesus said, that will return again. That will be the Holy Spirit that was in a man. That same Holy Spirit will return back in the flesh of my church at the end time and show the very same sign as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Look at the group it comes to. Look at the group that received it. What would they have said in Sodom or something like that? See? God knows where to stand it. Pray now. May the Lord of heaven help them just around the building. You just pray. Open your heart. Be real quiet. Sit still. Be reverent. A 
see a woman real nervous. It's praying I can't place where she's at. Just a minute, I'll find it. Yes. She's sitting right down here. The lady on this side of her looking at me has heart trouble. She has nervous trouble. If you believe with all your heart, both of you lay your hands on one another there. And believe with all your heart. Right there, that's right. Uh-huh. All right. God answered prayer. You're both healed now. You can go home. Be well. Isn't he wonderful? Now, what did they touch? I don't know those women. If that's right, raise up your hands, ladies, if I don't know you. That's right. All right. But God knows that. Now, wait. There's someone behind me praying. It's a man. He has kidney trouble. He has a lot of complications. He's wearing a brace. Mr. Balridge, if you believe with all your heart, I don't know you, do I, sir? You don't know me. But what was said is truth. If that's right, raise up your hands. All right. You're healed now. Your faith makes you well. Now you believe? Have faith. There's a lady sitting right out here, looking towards me, praying. That light's over her, the light that led the children of Israel, the pillar of fire, that was made manifest in flesh, said, I come from God and went, go to God, after his death, burial, and resurrection, Saul of Tarsus on his road down to Damascus, was stricken down by a light that put his eyes out. For a season he was blind. That same light was Jesus Christ, which is the light of the world. Saul, Saul, thou persecutest thou me. The woman is not praying for herself, but she's praying for a man. He's got heart trouble and unsaved. He lives in this city, but the woman is from another city, from Tucson. You believe with all your heart that he'll be healed? If you do, raise up your hand. I don't know you, do I, lady? Never seen him alive. That's what she's praying. Is that your prayer? If it is, wave your hand like this. Does thou believe with all your heart? Have faith in God. That Indian boy sitting out there on the end. God be with you, my brother. I don't know you, but I certainly have a respect for you. You want God to heal two sick children. That is true, isn't it? You believe he'll do it? You believe that he'll do it? Your mother's sitting right down below you there a little ways. Maybe that'll make you understand what I'm talking about. You believe God can tell me what's wrong with your mother? She's got lung trouble. God bless you, real American. There was a man sitting right here, looked over that Indian and had a great respect, sitting down the line there. Got a child he's praying for. Child's had an operation on some kind of a nerve of the brain, a balance nerve or something. That's right, sir. In California. I believe a Mr. Works. Works. That thing. Child will be all right. You believe? You with your hand up, you said you believe, do you? Just as you said that, something struck your heart. You had heart trouble. It's over. You don't live here. You come from north of here. You're from a city called Globe. I don't know you. Well, that's right. There's a little fellow sitting back there that's suffering with asthma, just about gone. Arthritis, also. His name's Jordan. 
You believe, O oh my Lord? When he knocks at your heart, do you believe he's here? Now, if you believe he's here, why don't you obey me as his servant? Put your hands over on one another if you're believers. See what the scripture says? Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now you pray for the one you got your hands laying on. Don't pray for yourself. And a little lady sitting down here from Chicago that's been bothered so much and got the menopause and the tubes are bothering you. Have faith now, you're going to be well. Don't be scared no more. Go home and rejoice because you're going to get over it. There's the light of God hanging over you. It's got to happen. Don't doubt, believe. Every one of you, the whole place is filled with the Holy Spirit right now. The angel of the Lord, the sign that he gives, the knock is coming on your heart's door. I'm the Lord thy God that heals all thy diseases. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Pray in your own way. Almighty God, author of life, giver of every good gift, I stand as your servant to claim to these people your gospel that the devil is bluffing them. Jesus Christ has healed them. Come out, Satan. I rebuke thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave the people that they can go and be made well. There you are. The healing power of God's upon you. Do with it what it seems good to do. God's great healing power is with you now. It is yours to claim. Rejoice in the Lord. Raise to your feet. I don't care how crippled you are. Raise up. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have what you've asked for.